There we go. Yeah, there she is. Yes. I know <laughs> that, that lady. That's nice to inform us. <laughs> I know that lady. Yeah. Um, well, well, Yuna, I want to thank you for joining this first of a series of interviews for the Seisma magazine thematically related to insects and attempting to make connections, which I think are intuitive, easy, natural uh, between entomology, biology, and specifically the study of insects and the humanities, different branches of the humanities. And you're nominally representing <laughs> theater and drama, although your reach it extends well beyond drama and theater. So I, I wanted to, well, maybe it'd be a good place to start just to have you introduce yourself as you would like to be introduced. Well, thank you. Thank you, Barrett. Yes, it's also a great pleasure to be in this conversation with you. Um, and it's uh, a real unexpected treat, really, because uh, um, to be very honest, my main venture into the field of etymology was with that one article that I wrote on the play bug. Um, and I really enjoyed working on that article. And it's one that I look back on with great, um, you know, pleasure and pride. Um, but I can't say that it uh, uh, unleashed a swarm of entomological criticism within drama and theater studies. <laughs> In fact, I'm not aware of any other. I know that people have enjoyed and appreciated that article, um, but I, um, I think it's understood more as one of uh, you know many contributions that are um, um, that are occurring to the uh, in this field of um, uh, well I called it theater of species that at one time that was a, a term I had for it which is really the intersection of animal studies and uh, performance theater and performance uh, and that in itself, is part of this larger field of uh, environmental humanities. Um, so that's how I get to be here in this conversation with you. Uh, and, and so I, you know, I'd love to talk about the that article, but it's really more uh, about this larger question of how can the cultural sphere and the sphere of, of imagination, ideology, values um, be in uh, productive conversation with the sciences uh, and the social sciences? What can we learn from each other? And that's perfect uh, because we can think in a big species and big concept way with this conversation. And uh, you will have both an experienced eye as well as a fresh eye on some of these ideas. And what I, what I, love about your body of work is that the biodiversity extends broadly. And so, for example, uh, one of my favorites that I just learned about recently was your study in an artistic way of a whale fall. You have some of the largest species of animals that have ever existed on planet Earth descending, decomposing, becoming the food for billions and you placed it in the context of an all you can eat and and bro more broadly in terms of environmental concerns. So we can discuss that writ large and also focus on ways that say this large, in the case of the blue whale, for example, the largest species of animal that's ever existed on planet earth, all the way to the smallest and some of the very smallest species of animals that exist on Earth do include worms and worm-like phyla of animals, but there are some species of insects, these multicellular, behaviorally relatively complex organisms that are no larger than some single-celled organisms. So a marvelous range in size and, and um, Yes. niche placement uh, we can explore. Yes, yeah. I love it that you um, have come across that piece and that you bring it up in this context 
precisely because of this, this scalar difference, you know, with the, the bugs being so tiny that in the play that I was talking about, you can't see them. It's the invisibility that's the most threatening thing. Um, and then the whale, which obviously stands in in our minds for, you know, uh, vast um, proportions. Um, and to, and in the whale fall, actually these two uh, extremes come together because the whale then becomes the world within which millions of organisms, including very tiny ones, um, you know, sustain their lives and do so for decades, if not centuries. And if we think about that in, say, the context of any art piece, and in particular, a theater piece, the size challenge, as you put it, can can play a role on either end of that spectrum. So how do you play out a whale? Do you necessarily have to scale it down? And how do you play out the existence of an insect? In the case of the play, the bug, that size challenge was uh, dealt with not, was dealt with, as you put it, through gesture by the actors, where mm -hmm. there was intention and there was um, interaction, but it was all fictive. It was all fictional. And so- Probably, probably although, as I said, there are always insects on stage. Good point, There's good point. Not insect. good so point. to some extent, it's not co completely fictional. Yes. Um, you know, it's that, that border between uh, our, our capacities to make up worlds and the world in which we're making up that world. That world is always there, the world, you know, in which we are living. Um, so, you know, in terms of the scalar thing, the, the great thing about theater and the great thing about art is that you can make up anything in it. You can do anything. Uh, it is a world of infinite potential. Uh, and that's why we, uh, humans need it so much and love it so much. And from the time we're, you know, as soon as we start talking as little kids, we get drawn into stories and into imagination. Uh, and that's because of its extraordinary potentiality. And that means that because you can imagine things there, uh, you also then um, get reassured that you can create new things that you can bring new things into the world. And that's how you get science. But so art is that very generative space and you can do anything. You can, you can have a play that's set inside the belly of the whale. You know, you can do a kind of Jonah and the whale play. I don't know if you just, I just read the, um, the uh, novel Whale Fall that oh. just came out. It's ah, by yes. Daniel Krauss. I haven't read that yet. It's fabulous. It's yeah? total page turner uh. it's a wonderful book because it's so much about what i'm talking about how the imagination um can assist us in knowing this the, the realities of this world we live in you know i think for too long imagination has been associated with the supernatural or the surreal or you know fantasy things you make up but the the uh, imagine the world of imagination and fiction is also the world in which we tiny little humans with our very limited uh, you know uh, capacities and scope can have these powerful life changing encounters with other organisms mm -hmm. and with other uh, systems and um, um, processes. And that's what this uh, um, novel, the whale fall novel does. I mean, it, it, he gets swallowed by a whale. He's in the first stomach. He's in the second stomach. He, there are all these things inside the whale. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's terrifying, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's completely preposterous, but it's also just so inspiring as, um, you know, as a feat of, faith and trust hmm. um, that we can we can go deep into the lives of each other mm -hmm. with our imagination and with um you know with respect knowledge 
um, faith. I mean, he's obviously somebody who knows everything about whale anatomy. He's not making any of that up. He is a, <laughs> he studied his science. I think maybe he's a scientist. And so to me, that's very important. Ah, yeah. I was just going to ask you, to what extent is that important or necessary to have accuracy as a foundation, an armature? Is it even important, use the word important, is it even important when it comes to theater, drama, and beyond? Does an audience need some stability in terms of the known to explore the unknown? Well, uh, by, well there are many knowns. <laughs> uh, there, there are the familiar knowns, mm -hmm. which is a sort of sociological surround, which is what's used in the theater for realism. In realism, it's the stuff of your daily life that kind of grounds you in the story. Mm -hmm. But there are other knowns, such as that all the things that you, Barrett, know as an entomologist, mm -hmm. or that this guy, Daniel Krauss, found out in order to write his novel, he found out all those knowns mm -hmm. from science, mm -hmm. um, from very seriously, you know, learning about them from people who have devoted their lives to studying them. Those knowns are um, unfamiliar knowns, but at, they are wondrous. They are extremely um, inspiring and exciting and uh, they are the knowns that I'm most committed to, are the unfamiliar knowns. Uh, I mean, unfamiliar to the uh, lay, to the non-scientific uh, audience member. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is that, um, well, just quite simply, I believe that the more we understand uh, the scientific realities to the extent that science um, has discovered them, the, the more we will understand how extraordinary this world is and our lives are and how important it is for us all to be committed to saving it. And it's more important um, than things that are narrowly focused on, for me, on my, my identity, on my group, on my nation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so to me, now, you know, you can probably hear that I begin to sound sort of evangelical and uh, have as a kind of religious tone. And I'll be honest, it's my religion. Nature is my religion. I believe in biophilia. I believe that um, the, the more we um, can imaginatively encounter the realities of this planet, and by realities, I mean scientific realities, but encounter them not in a cold, dead, scientific way, not to, not to mention, not to say that science is cold and dead, but you know what I mean, the tone in which um, sometimes these uh, this information comes to us can be, uh, you know, uh, cold. Um, so it can be framed in other ways, in the ways that draw people in and that uh, want people to know more about that story. And, and, and get invested in making that story come out right. And by using the word cold, it brings up the, what I find to be unfortunate, sterile, formulaic nature that's often jargon filled and less accessible that the culture of academic science typically engages in. Instead of conveying the, the wonder through um, not just clear and accurate writing, but engaging writing uh, is, is a lapse or a loss, because while there is value to the formula, a reader going into a peer-reviewed article knows what to expect where and can find the information relatively efficiently, you lose out on the potential to attract and excite and inspire audiences, including those most knowledgeable within your potentially narrow field. And theater uh, itself See, but, uh, is- Yeah. Can is, I uh, ask you though, Barrett, don't you feel that that's changing? I mean, even you know someone like you and many others like you who do those TED Talks, 
mm -hmm. um, you know, have, uh, I think, really begun to show that you, you can take a little bit of time <laughs> away from the lab uh, and, and work in this other more public sphere, and that that's um, valuable to, on both sides. Absolutely. In fact, the culture of conducting science has placed great value on having outreach components, even worked within grants that you apply for. And these outreach components are orchestrated to invite the world to appreciate what is happening, how natural phenomena operate, and what you're attempting to contribute to yeah. expose how natural phenomena operate. So yes, there's the outreach component. And what I was suggesting was it need not depend on something separate from the peer-reviewed science. And one way to illustrate that is literally through illustrations, for example. Drawing in people with beautiful visuals can entice and excite about the science. Yeah. And, and when we think about theater, um, one one question I wanted to pose to you, and we certainly don't have to limit it to theater, but do you find that theater is significantly different, unique relative to other media in translating messages and maybe even uh, pertaining to entomology or insects? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think every art form is unique mm -hmm. and different. And uh, there's certain, here's how I think of it. There's certain things you can think in theater that you can think through and understand by theater that you can't understand in any other way. Mm. Uh, it is a space of uh, knowledge production, just like the lab or the library or the archive. It is a space of knowledge production. Mm. There are things you do there uh, because of what that medium uh, has put into place and has historically developed, which is this uh, little facsimile of the real world. You know, it's a place which has time and space and gesture and sound and air, and um, it, it, it's, it's like a little world. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a completely controlled world. Well, not completely because the insects, <laughs> the insects are there um, and the air is there. Um, but it's it's largely controlled, and so within that you can play, mm. um, and you can, uh, you know, just like as you do in a lab, you can remove certain things, you can add certain things. Um, um, but what you're playing with, the the the, the elements you're playing with, are not uh, the things in your, in, you know, in the petri dish or whatever. They are are things like voice, language, movement, sound, uh, costume, those kinds of things. And by manipulating those, you can actually understand certain kinds of things that you can't understand in any other way. Hmm. Um, now, I'm not saying that all theater does this. I'm saying that that's the potential of great theater is that it will, um, allow you to have an experience which is not just an emotional experience but an uh, experience of knowledge that you couldn't have in any other way if you watch hamlet if you watch waiting for godot if you watch carol churchill's far away you will have a knowledge that you wouldn't have in any other way okay and not just a, not just an experience not just a feeling so that's something that i like to insist on about the Theater, that it's a place for knowledge production. And what about the role of spontaneity? So for example, you have this ephemeral, unless it's recorded, but I'm contrasting it with film and other media. You've got this uh, typically contained area with an audience and here it is. And basically anything can happen. Is that- yes. Yeah, that's a huge part of it. That's what we all bring into it. We all bring into it our livingness mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that we know that anything can happen. But we also know that a tremendous amount of thought and artistry has been invested in creating a structure 
uh, that's intended to unfold in a certain way. But we know that it could fail, that it could, <laughs> right. you know, the guy, the you know, that Hamlet could have a heart attack right in front of you <laughs> to give yeah. an awful example. But, <laughs> right. but you know, uh, you could get stung by a bee on stage to give an example that'll please you. Um, so anything can can happen. And that, what does that give us? I mean, that gives us that sharpness of, it should, it should, doesn't always, because uh -huh. a lot of time people just go to the theater to see stuff that just helps them sleep more comfortably. You know, it's just boring. <laughs> a lot of theater is, you know, uh, so when we talk about theater, we're talking about, again, a huge, huge range of phenomena, of behaviors, activities, and everything from Broadway, which is all so completely, you know, controlled and te technologically, uh, you know, the show is set and to, uh, you know, to a little play in the woods or something that some um, experimental theater group is doing. So all that is included in there. But that liveness is a, that you mentioned uh, is a, a feature of it, but it's it's liveness that's uh, always um, there is a potential. I mean, that 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 the moment and the infinite potential potential of a moment, right? Anything can happen at any moment that can erupt. We know that that can erupt into this art form, you know, mm -hmm. like an earthquake. It doesn't usually, but it's there uh -huh. in a way that it's not there in a painting or a novel. And if we think about the unique qualities and offerings of theater and drama, specifically as it intersects with entomology, I want I want to share. I've been thinking about insects in theater, and so I've got a a short list, and I'll run them by. Oh, you. great! Yeah, and we, and we can. And I'm skipping over millennia of examples of traditional dance mm -hmm. ceremony. And you could argue theater because it's such a gray oh. area between um, occurring in almost every culture that I was exploring across the world with many uh, totemic organisms in Australia being insect in nature with ceremonies and dance particular uh, tied to insects, as well as, and the list goes on, I'm going to jump to more modern day examples. Okay. And we can think about why the insects and why yeah. theater. So yeah. uh, easy place to start is Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis and how that's been adapted to the stage many times. So for example, Mikhail Baryshnikov was Gregor Samsa, that despondent salesman turned into a... Cockroach. Well, was it a cockroach? Was it a dung beetle? Even, oh, right, right. even Franz Kafka wanted to be vague about that. In fact, he demanded of his publisher, please don't include an image of an insect on the cover, right? So you have Mikhail Baryshnikov, you had Roman Polanski in Paris playing the role of Gregor Samsa at one point. And then another example, uh, Federico Garcia Lorca's The Butterfly's Evil Spell in which a cockroach falls for a butterfly. And while the, the final pages of the play were lost to time, we know that it didn't end well for the cockroach. <laughs> um, and then there's uh, an Egyptian um, playwright named Tafik Al-Hakim, and he produced The Fate of the Cockroach. And it's hilarious when you read it as a satire in which cockroaches and ants uh, essentially go to war. And you, you see how um, strangely inept some are. And then- this is, is that a play too? It is, yeah. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Another example is, and I can send you this list. Um, this is amazing. I yeah. don't know. I mean, obviously I know Metamorphosis and I've heard of the Lorca, but I've never read it. Yeah. It's, and I certainly didn't know about the Egyptian. Go on. And another one is, um, this is really recent, 2018. Melita Rostan produced Cockroach. And it's a it's a 
definite direct play off of Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis, but it's with a big twist. So she she really speaks in a feminist way about gendered violence. And she pulls from Ovid's Greek myths and all the violence uh, mm -hmm. that's enacted or performed by so many of the, go the gods. And so she plays with that and really um, what okay. I understand, I, I only saw a portion of the performance online, but um, in interesting ways. Yeah. And then well, there's, and then there's, and I might be pronouncing the names incorrectly, but Carl and Josef Kapex, the insect yes, yes. play. And so that's a, that's a that's a fun satire as well. Where the What's main, the name of that? Remind me. One of the names is the insect play, although it's translated from the Czech in a few different ways. Yes, yes, yes. And I've got it right here. Uh, somewhere around there. Anyway, it's. It's a it's a fascinating one. Uh, and then you've got Dave, either Ives or Eves, or Ive, yeah. Time Flies, which was a segment of Mere Mortals in 1997. And this one is, I, I wish I could have seen this, but it features mayflies, order ephemeroptera. And as we all know, uh, they're pretty short-lived, at least as adults. So you might live weeks, months, even over a year, as an immature, but mayflies, the Latinate name for the order is ephemeroptera, short-lived winged one in Greek. And here, mayflies face potentially a day. In fact, the shortest lived insect as an adult is one species of mayfly in the Southeast United States. The female emerges as an adult and lives for an average of five minutes. So in those five minutes, she has to not only spread her wings, but mate, lay eggs before yeah. she perishes. So this play plays on the idea that the actors are burdened with the knowledge of having a one-day courtship. Amazing. And there, there, are lot, there are lots of other examples. Sure. I'd be remiss if I didn't include Isabella Rossellini's green porno, in which she has, I mean, they were televised, mm -hmm. but she has these theatrical performances for a whole series, which included, uh, say, half a dozen arthropods, most of them insects, and another series where she has a spider and a bed bug. So here she's single-handedly, with uh, just a rare exceptions, um, performing with really great accuracy in terms of the entomology, but in such a pared down cosmetically and costume wise, engaging fun way and yeah. dramatic way because the lives of insects are so dramatic. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Well, uh, uh, Barrett, firstly, bravo. <laughs> uncovered all these wonderful instances. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I did know about the insect play and I should, uh, uh, you know, I should have gone back to that to prepare, but um, it's not surprising that so many, uh, you know, are riffing on uh, Kafka, uh, because I mean, that was just such a, um, such opening, you know, for the imagination, you know, just, just that act of transformation. There's, there's actually a wonderful novel called Roach in which a uh, cockroach wakes up in Times Square and uh, realizes he's a man. He's <laughs> a human. <laughs> oh my goodness, I've got to look that up. Yeah, and he's just disgusted by what he has to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine it. So picture our sensory apparatus. So the the roach, as you've as you've discussed in your writings, um, non-human animals aren't that far removed from human animals, right? And even in such distant relatives as the hexapods, the insects, you've got profound similarities. But generally, we think of them as these alien organisms on Earth. Why? Well, a lot of reasons. Not only just because they're small, but because well, they don't close their eyes. 
They don't move their eyes, right? They have these static eyes with, with interesting exceptions we can talk about. And well, they move in odd ways. They're hyper diverse, living very different lifestyles in different nooks and crannies and niches. Um, but also their sensory percepts and the apparatus that allows them to perceive the world is very different. And if we think about uh, Thomas Nagel's, uh, a philosopher, Thomas Nagel's famous thing about um, how to, what it means to be bad or his, basically the bottom line is it's impossible to subjectively know what it is to be a bat to place our feet in a bat's shoes, right? Well, if bats are fellow mammals, if we have to go to other vertebrates, say more distantly to fish, and then outside the vertebrates, we're talking about half a billion year old shared ancestry with highly derived insects, how much can we relate? Yeah. And I, I argue, that we can relate in really profound ways. It might just take more effort. Well, uh, I completely agree with you. And I also think that there's a history to this. Uh, and I mentioned a little bit of that history in my article, but mainly it is that for many of these reasons that you've just uh, uh, enumerated, uh, humans have tended to um, frame insects as if they were from another planet. So they often, uh, in terms of imaginative production, they often uh, inhabit spaces of science fiction. Mm. Uh, and they, you know, they, uh, they, as we know, like the fly and, and those types of things. Um, so that was one kind of thing. I think that's changing, Barrett. I think that because of climate change and because of our growing awareness of our interdependence, and our sense that, you know, what's happening, for example, to the bees is happening to our food, mm. uh, you know, and that those dots are getting connected much tighter, much closer than ever before. So I think now you, you have a different kind of orientation, which is uh, a real curiosity, a respect, uh, I mean, on the part of non-scientists, mm -hmm. uh, on the part of artists, on the part of just ordinary people. That, that these uh, apparently alien creatures or these inconvenient creatures mm -hmm. are in fact vitally important to our future and to our understand to our, the, our understanding of our um, no sorry they're vitally important to an understanding that will produce a viable future for us, that if we don't take them on board now, if we don't learn from them and learn how we, like us they are, how unlike, we are not going to have a future. They might have a future, mm -hmm. but we may not, or we, we may have a, a future after a lot of suffering. I mean, I think that's guaranteed anyway, but um, so I think that uh, we're in a moment of great transformation, just the fact that you and I are talking here and that you read my article is, you know, it's sort of extraordinary. Most people, uh, when I, you know, they just look at me like, you know, you're a professor of theater who's talking to an entomologist, what? But but that's happening, as you know, more and more and more. It, this is not unusual now. Now, what is, I agree that this has sparked concern and mm -hmm. increased appreciation for our hexapod and invertebrate neighbors to a possibly unprecedented degree in human history. It's still insufficient, but it's uh, increased greatly. Now, um, when you speak of, say, the two of us talking together, it reminds me that we still have a long way to go in terms of interdisciplinary or so-called multidisciplinary studies or interactions. Because when I when I see when I hear mention of maybe there's a grant available for multidisciplinary studies, 
for me as a biologist, that almost exclusively means neurobiology with behavior, molecular biology with its subdisciplines of the study of life in a strict science sense. And very rarely do you find opportunities where science and humanities are connected in fundable, supported ways that really advance ideas. And why is this troubling to me? It's troubling because when we think about great discoveries, oftentimes Nobel Prizes are awarded to people who explicitly talk about very disparate fields being brought together. And that was the reason for the success in thinking in a really novel way outside of what might be the stuff of a subdiscipline. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, I think that what, in some ways this is an old problem um, that is taking a long, long time to solve, which is the famous two cultures problem, uh, you know, that, that C.P. Snow called the two cultures. The fact that in modernity, knowledge was divided between nature and culture, and that the sciences got nature and um, the humanities and social sciences got culture, as if these are two separate realms. And, you know, until even the 19th century, where you had scientists like Humboldt, who, you know, were absolutely um, uh, understood the connection uh, between uh, cultural lives and, and uh, uh, natural, biological, botanical realities, um, and, and knew that you can't understand the one without the other, they, you know, they were modeling this holistic thing that we're now trying to, to create. But for a long time, the, these boundaries were very strictly policed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bruno Latour has written about why and what we, what we got out of that. And one of the things we got out of that was a kind of a alienated earth. And then, you know, a, a thing where our cultures moved away from their understanding of their being embedded in um, natural processes. And we, our culture behaves as if we live on Mars. And, you know, as if we're sort of floating up here and we're interested in, in you know, things that are unaffected by the, the systems of the planet, the geophysical systems. That's been the, uh, the I think, the terrible, ruinous um, gesture of modernity, uh, you know, that, that uh, the whole modern era was about sort of taking culture that is imaginative thought away from uh, geophysical realities instead of the way it had always been for centuries and centuries and centuries before that, that these two were intertwined. People knew that they had, that their gods had to be the gods that would make that, that tree flower, you know, because their lives depended on it. We act like it doesn't matter what the weather is, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, we'll just turn, turn this button and... Ea Wilson, entomologist, and among other things, author of Consilience, argued yes. about the marriage or at least the interbreeding of different disciplines for productive gain and, and hearken back to the Renaissance and earlier where things were uh, very much intertwined. And we can think about Wunderkammer, these cabinets of curiosities, yeah. which included art as well as natural science artifacts. And Wilson promoted some provocative and I thought really interesting ideas. Like for example, humanities, I don't remember the exact quote, but he talked about how the humanities uh, could potentially be blinded by ignoring the lessons of Darwin. Oh, absolutely, but this is everything I've been saying to you is about this, that, that the humanities have to uh, receive the gifts of scientific discovery. I don't think we should waste our time uh, worrying about the differences. Mm -hmm. I think it's really time to embrace the possibilities of, of connection, conversation, and learning uh, from each other by respecting, uh, you know, our histories, our traditions, our methodologies. They're very different. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, really different languages and so on. 
but I think that openness that we, that we are experiencing now, I, I, you know, because being an environmental humanist, I do come across a lot of scientists who are very, um, very committed to looking at art, trying to, you know, understand how, what the cultural uptake on some of these uh, findings and these very, very urgent realities, uh, what is the cultural uptake? Because of course, that's what mediates the policy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, impacts later on. And so that, that little piece of it, it's not just about uh, translating the science to the public. It's not about that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's a much deeper um, task that humanists have, which is to um, use the this, this science in order to foster a, a different kind of biocentric ideology, a biocentric culture, a culture that, um, that really enjoys, that loves stories about you know, the, this amazing real world and these creatures in it. I don't want to uh, bog us down with semantics too much, but I wanted to bring up a few terms that I think are really conceptually interesting and I think are relevant to what you just said. So for example, you present the term eco-theater. And, and the question in my mind is, was the primary mission to entertain, to educate, or to explore a relationship with natural ecosystems, right? And connected to that is this term that I read in your works, ecospheric consciousness, as well as ecocriticism. Um, and I could ask, in what ways can one study the humanities from an ecological perspective? Okay, yeah. So eco-criticism is a huge field. It is all the writing that's um, focused on understanding the relationship between the um, art, literature, and the environment. So, you know, it, it often starts off with people like Thoreau and Emerson and, you know, the, na the great nature writers. Um, one of the first great eco-critics was a man named Lawrence Buell, who was at Harvard. Um, and he wrote a, a number of very influential books, but this is a big field within literature, literary studies, called eco-criticism. So, and it includes writing about novels, poetry, um, and theater. Eco-theater is actually the practice of making theater that is interested in and sensitive to issues of environment and issues of species and landscapes. And neither of these are my terms, although I was one of the first people to uh, start thinking about eco-theater. Uh -huh. uh, not making it, but theorizing and you know, trying to foster it. So eco-theater, to answer your question about the primary goal, um, the primary goal is all three of those. Uh, so there is no primary goal, uh, because theater is never just one thing. Uh, and also eco-theater is not one thing. There are many kinds of eco-theaters, uh, people doing eco-theater, and none of us agree with each other. And you know, <laughs> everyone having a lovely argument, which is so important. It's yeah. really, really good. Um, so it's, it is definitely to entertain. I mean, all theater wants to engage its audience. The, the first rule of theater is you don't want to bore them. You know, you don't want to... <laughs> to think that, oh my God, I've wandered into a church or I've wandered into a classroom. No, it's theater. You're here for something else. It's not, it's not school, it's not church. The second thing is you want them to have an experience and you want to produce a, a kind of opportunity for a new thinking, feeling from within that experience. Mm. That, In a nutshell, for me, that's it. It's to engage people, let them have a tremendously enjoyable time while experiencing something new, which could also be very disturbing and terrifying and upsetting. Uh, we all, as humans, enjoy being upset and terrified, no problem. <laughs> uh, um, so it's all those things. Um, there's also a whole eco-theater practice that's about creating sustainable theater like, you know, how to make theater that in itself is responsible to, um, you know, environmental 
um, behaviors and practices. So that's a very wide thing. Okay, thirdly, the word ecospheric. That's a word that I'm particularly um, uh, committed to and uh, fond of. It's again, not my word, although I think I'm among current people, I'm the one who uses it most. It uh, was introduced by uh, the land, uh, the uh, field ecologist Stan Rowe, R-O-W-E. And the reason I like it, Barrett, is that firstly, I don't like the word environment. I've never liked that word because it suggests that it's outside, you know, uh, the environment as if, you know, I'm somehow <laughs> separate from it. Whereas, of course, the environment is right inside us and, you know, there is no... So that, that's a very misleading word. And for a long time, it's led to this, this um, distinction between you know, the, the human self and everything around us, as if there is a difference. There is no difference. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a word I don't like. The word ecology has a, a very specifically scientific feel to it. When you say ecology, most people think about uh, system science, ecological systems. It's a, it is a science. So for that reason, I like ecospheric because I'm hoping it's the it's a more capacious term. It's the term that brings that keeps eco, which is you know you know and you've written in your articles is a, is the, the core term here the the word you know our home our home planet, but but spheric like those other you know like the the uh, what is it the uh, lithosphere the uh, aquas the hydrosphere you know we have these four spheres. Um, to me, ecospheric includes all of them as well as the cultural sphere, mm -hmm. and you know, which is the sphere of history and politics and psychology and all those things. So I want, I'm looking for a word that uh, captures the capaciousness that we must uh, knowledge as the frame of our knowledge. I'm thinking along the uh, well. Tangentially to that, I've been thinking a lot about the use of the term cultural entomology versus ethno entomology. Hmm. And Charles Hogue in the early 1980s introduced, formalized this idea of studying insects in terms of their impact on human cultures. And what he focused on with cultural entomology and distinguished it from ethno-entomology was the idea that here it affects the arts, things that aren't, and this will be uh, contentious, but necessary to our survival, immediately to our survival, right? Food you can think of as haute cuisine versus food for survival sake, right? And so it, it's really hard to draw lines. And so semantics yeah. can be uh, troubling but necessary and yeah I mean oh. we, I think we should ask ourselves why we're so interested in drawing lines what we get out of those lines mm -hmm. you know I, I understand that that is one of the um, important moves for any analysis you mm -hmm. have to slice you have to create you know you have to show what you're talking about but why we can't do that in a lighter way, in a way that doesn't make those lines into walls, right? Into you know uh, chasms. Uh, I think that that's really important right now because they they create a false sense of um, field or and a false sense of knowledge, as if we know that this subject stops here, as mm -hmm. if psychology stops here. You know, right? Uh, you know, there's. There's utility in categorizing, but not arbitrary categorization. And uh, a fourth term that you use that I think you've introduced is zoesis, this idea of uh, animal cultural practices. And you've given examples of what zoesis includes. And I, I noticed on uh, your website, I was looking at just the list of courses you teach, and I want to take them all, by the way. Oh, I want to take <laughs> you all there. There's, there's one course that particularly jumped out to me. Uh, let's see, Zoesis, Animals in Contemporary Media and Culture. 
and you have a photo of students uh, above that, and they're all holding up the really superb series of reaction books focused yeah. on animals. And uh, almost all of them are vertebrates, save for Claire Preston's bee, which was held up by one student. And I was wondering how significant a role, and I'm imagining that it's student dependent, but their choice, but how, uh, to what extent insects play a role in that course? Uh, it, 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 that was student dependent. Um, and uh, so I'd have to say, I mean, that was, uh, that, that series I love so much because it is ecospheric. It is both, you know, yeah, I know. I have, I have my own, I have my entire oh, series over there. And all the arthropods. <laughs> and John Burt is one of my heroes for, for editing that series. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, um, so what's great about it is that it's, it's a really environmental humanities science kind of, it's, it's called nature, it's, Science and culture, uh, both sides are represented, which is why I, I teach it in my class. And I had them, each student had to uh, choose one and then adopt that species for the entire semester mm. and do a lot of research on that species and make and do experiments, uh, you know, in which whatever kinds of experiments they did, lots of crazy ones, and, and also create some, um, some public engagements about those uh, that. Uh, their species, as well as make some artwork about that species. So again, trying to model that that uh, our connections with uh, animals can be cultural, scientific, experimental, creative, um, and need to be all these things. So that multidisciplinary, uh, you know, just to, um, encourage that multidisciplinary impulse and. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the B, oh, the, the artwork that the B um, student, the one who adopted B, she, she did an incredible like rap epic where the bees rapped. I mean, she wrote it all and then she performed <laughs> it. Wow. Oh, it was just amazing. But, but of course, you know, she brought in that, the, the couple of amazing movies about bees. And then, um, so th there was, uh, unfortunately, I can't, give you what you hoped I could, which is how many insects were involved. <laughs> <laughs> I, I let them use any animal and That's great. So they, they, you know, they, they went with whatever they... You use the word experiment and experimental and uh, among your other many positions, you're the director of the Center for Experimental Humanities at New York University. And I was wondering, when are the humanities experimental? When are they not? Oh, well, they're experimental when they talk and think the way we've been talking. And okay. <laughs> but but, but uh, firstly, I should say, Barrett, that I'm no longer the director. I ah. was director before I became dean for humanities. Gotcha. Uh, but that center is, is still very much there. And I'm very much involved with it. Um, and experimental humanities, the way we think of it in that center or in that program is uh, that it's... Um, uh, the humanities, which uh, uh, in, which um, um, combines criticality and creativity, so it's where there's uh, critical thinking, you know, in the traditional humanities way, a lot of uh, attention to history, theory, criticism, all that, but also then to creativity, to art making, to art practice, and then also social engagement to see how. Uh, the the subjects one is studying um, also uh, can can be in conversation with the community, with public institutions, and so on. So again, it's uh, it offers an MA in interdisciplinary studies. Uh -huh. So that's what it is. But we, I, I really love that uh, the phrase experimental humanities. Uh, we also have public humanities. Um, you know, there are many humanities now. Just yesterday, I got an email for the arboreal humanities, the, the, which is plant studies. You know, that's another huge field now, plant studies in the humanities. That's and great. humanities, which is ocean studies. So, um, you know, it's you- It's not botanical, it's arboreal. So in the trees. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. 
Yeah, that's great. there's also, you know, there's a, a big plant studies field. There's uh, Natasha Myers in uh, Canada who has a, a, the concept of the plant, plant shopocene, you know, to think about rather than the anthropocene. It's uh -huh. beautiful, beautiful, uh -huh. really, really. You should check that out because, of course, the, the insects would be very welcome in the plant shopocene. I will. I mean, I first, I love the term anthropocenes that has been used in, in the writings because it's yeah. a beautiful, uh, humorous take on a very stark to topical topic. Yeah. I, I had a, a, a couple more questions that relate to insects specifically in theater that I wanted to, to bounce off of you. And one we see like in all the examples I list, in the handful of examples I listed, and there are many more, obviously, where insects play a role in theater and drama. The insects symbolize things. And I was wondering, are there, is there a place and what would it look like for insects not to be symbols or metaphors, but insects to just be insects? And the example that comes to mind from cinema is the French production Microcosmos, where the insects were insects, and you can read into them any which way you please, but the dramas were apparent without any narration. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you can read, uh, you can read into animals and insects, uh, and humans cannot resist reading into them. That's yeah. what we do. We interpret, we symbolize, we make it things into metaphors. And we have for a very long time, especially in the humanities and the arts, just treated the natural world as a source for symbols and metaphors. The whole thrust of animal studies and environmental humanities is against that. Mm -hmm. It's to, to come back to the wondrous realities of these things. So how can uh, bugs be them, uh, uh, um, insects be themselves on stage? The play that I was uh, that I wrote about is one of the few examples in which what's happening is that he's being bitten by in actual insects, mm -hmm. and, and that's what people are. You know, uh, of course, the play plays with the idea that oh, come on, it's not actual insects. This this must be his fantasies. This must be his symbol of his fear. Just you know, all that history comes up. But in a way, it's also forcing us to experience insects as insects. Because as I said in the article, people started scratching themselves in the air. <laughs> yes. You know, because it's a, it's a contagious uh, uh, thing, like yawning, a uh, contagious somatic response. So that's where we, for a second, we were um, liberated from symbolization. We were able to just be with the insects as insects. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, this somatic, contagious, yawning-like uh, reaction that appeared to infiltrate the audience. So do you see the power of theater working in another way, in another manner, contagiously eliciting biophilia and specifically Absolutely. emotionally positive responses to insects? Totally, totally, totally. Barrett, that's my, again, my whole... Uh, um, um, commitment and goal and hope is to teach uh, environmental humanities in order to foster biophilia. The whole uh, thing we need the arts to be doing is returning us to a great appreciation and love of the more than human world uh, and, and of infusing our culture with that love so that you know it does become something that we all really care about instead of culture being again this thing that is up up on Mars and that's floating around, not not talking about the air and the winds and the, you know, the species and the landscapes. Uh, to me, biophilia is the most important value, aesthetic value uh, at for this moment of climate crisis. Wow, I could talk with you all day. I think that's a really beautiful place to wrap up our discussion about the intersection of entomology and theater. And I really appreciate it, Yuna. This has been a lovely opportunity.
Likewise, Barrett, what a pleasure to talk to you. And also what a pleasure to get to, to look at that amazing shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>